warm welcome to all our campuses that are watching today with us. We're excited to have you join the service there in Pitt Meadows, those that are watching at Commercial, and those that are watching at Strathcona. We're delighted that you took time out of your day to come and to worship with us. I know you're hungry for God's Word, and so today's message is a message that hopefully will just inspire you to live radically for Him with extreme generosity. Then, of course, we have those that are maybe watching online, or maybe you're listening by podcast in another part of the world. We're so delighted that you took time to listen today. So, church family, would you give all these campuses a really warm welcome? Let them know that we're glad to have them join us today. Thank you. We are in a series called Big Generosity, and we use that title because our God has big, big generosity. No more greater generosity than for God to give us His Son for everybody, for the entire world. That is big generosity. So that's the family DNA, and we want to, of course, tap into the DNA that we have through our Lord Jesus Christ. We're going to be in Luke chapter 14 today, so if you have your Bibles, you can get that Luke chapter 14, or else if you have the app, all the notes are on the app today, so we have it available on your app today. If you don't have one, just download the app, all the notes will be there for you as well. Luke chapter 14, verses 7 to 14. It's a, it's a powerful message on generosity. We're going to mine it out today. In order to do that, we're going to have a little illustration. We have some empty chairs up here. And you might have been wondering, what are the chairs for? Well, I'm glad you asked the question because we're going to do that. How many here have ever played musical chairs? Anybody played musical chairs? All right, good number of you played musical chairs. Well, they, this text today is kind of like that. The people were playing musical chairs, except with no music. They were jostling for different seats. And so I need some volunteers for this to work today. And actually, I need five volunteers. So could I have five hands? Who would like to volunteer tonight? Okay, there's a hand. Jeremy, okay, another hand right here. Five, if you, five volunteers could just come up over here to this side. Vince, you're volunteering. Come on up here, brother. We need five volunteers. You just stand over here on this side. First five, make it up here, you're, you're going to be, and uh, yeah, come on up here, just move that rope, yeah, one, two, three, four, and Vince gives me five, all right, excellent, five volunteers, very good, give these volunteers a big hand, they maybe come up a little closer so we can all see, the, aren't they a good looking bunch, just diverse here, yeah, now, have you guys all lived in Vancouver for a while? No, yes, yes. So a quick question, need a little help from you in order this to work right. Who would you say would be one of the most influential people in Vancouver? <laughs> Jimmy Patterson, anybody else? Steve Nash. Steve Nash, any other thoughts? <laughs> Jeremy, you don't know? Okay. No, no. <laughs> That'd be way better. How about, any, any thoughts? Influential people? No? Okay. I like Steve Nash. Let's go with Steve Nash. That would be a good, because we have his uh, gym right across the street from us here. Steve Nash, okay. So let's say Steve Nash is the most uh, influential person. Now, the chairs behind you are arranged in order from all kind of odd numbering, one, two, three, four, and five, and six. Now, Jesus was invited to this place, and there was a very important ruler. He ran this house, and so he... The people were seated in these different seats. But the most important person got to sit in the, in the number one seat. And so since you picked number Steve, Steve Nash, we'll make you the most important person. So you're Steve tonight. This is Steve right there. Everybody say, hello, Steve. Hello, Steve. This is Steve. So he's the most important person at our table. All right. Now, the, what the other guests want to do, this is the way they worked in the Greco-Roman period is you wanted to sit beside the most important person. That was your whole deal. And the reason you want to sit by the most important person is that's how you made it up in the world. You, you networked. You, more than our world today, you really wanted to get ahead. You had to get beside the most important person, tell them about your deal, and hopefully somebody would see beside them, and you would, you'd, you'd move up. You'd make connections. And so now the rest of you, you, you get to pick your seats. So the rest of you can just pick your seats, whatever seat you like. <laughs> All right, they got the deal. They moved quick. They, they just playing musical chairs. They jumped into their seats. All right, so 
Now we've got, uh, who's in seat number two? Jeremy's in seat number, do you know who Steve Nash is? No. <laughs> <laughs> I am Steve Nash. This is Steve Nash right there. <laughs> Okay, Vince, do you know who Steve Nash is? Of course Can you? Right yeah, he's right there. <laughs> Steve Nash is a very, very important basketball player, and he's an influential business person. He, Steve Nash does a lot in our city. And so, like, I mean, if you're sitting beside Steve Nash, you'd want his autograph. And, and I mean, he is, I mean, you'd want to take a selfie with Steve Nash. You'd Instagram a picture. You'd put it on your Facebook if you were <laughs> beside Steve Nash. You'd, you would be, you know... What's your favorite sport, Jeremy? Soccer. Okay, who's the most favorite soccer player there is? Oh, Neymar. Yeah. Who's the f Okay, so be, it, he'd be like that. Yeah. Steve Nash would be like that in basketball. So how does it feel to be sitting beside uh, Steve Nash now? What an honor. Yes, what an honor, exactly. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty important to fit, sit beside him, right? And uh, so you're actually become more famous just because you're sitting beside Steve Nash. Now, the thing is, we are... We have something, an empty chair here. There's something that's a little bit unexpected to happen, and uh, there's uh, somebody else who's going to be joining the meeting, but because they had so many meetings, they were running late for this. So anybody here today had a lot of meetings this week, Things you just had a very busy week, a lot of meetings. Anybody? Because you know you're going to be, okay, David had a lot of meetings. Come on, David, you're called upon, so come on up. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> come on, give David a big hand. David had a lot of meetings, a lot of meetings, but he, he was invited to, he was invited. Now, as David comes up, he, he's so important that he had so many, many meetings that uh, Jeremy jumped into, into seat number two, but Jeremy, you know what? You go to seat number six. <laughs> you go to seat number six. David, you're so important. Welcome to our meeting. Welcome to the supper. Please sit beside Mr. Steve Nash. Now, you just in an instant, Jeremy, you got bumped all the way down to the end of the line. How, how does that make you feel, Jeremy? Sad. It makes you feel sad. Yeah. It makes you feel maybe even a little embarrassed, right? Disappointed that you got bumped down, right? This is what was going on in the text that we're going to read today. They were having a party. Jesus was watching what was going on. They'd actually invited him to this party, and they were watching him. But it turns around that Jesus was actually watching the guests and watching what was going on. And so he's going to address them on how to live generously. You guys have been amazing volunteers. You helped set the stage, no pun intended. So would you give your volunteers a big hand today? Thank you. You guys can be seated. That's it. That's it. It's over. Yeah. <laughs> You're looking for some food, I know. <laughs> oh, that's great. Thank you again for doing that. Our text is Luke chapter 14. And what happens in Luke 14 is Jesus gets invited to the ruler of the Pharisees to this amazing meal that they're going to have. And when he gets there, they've kind of set it up, the ruler has. He's invited one person for sure that's sick. That's a guy with dropsy. Dropsy, we don't use that name much anymore. It's a disease with swollen joints. Your joints get swollen. Your legs get swollen. Very uncomfortable. And they, It's a Sabbath, and they're going to watch what he's going to do. And Jesus heals him. And, of course, they watched this happen. They set it up, and they say, hey, what are you doing healing on the Sabbath? You shouldn't be working. Jesus responds, you know what? If one of you had a donkey and a fell into a well, you'd be getting that donkey out. And from there, he goes on to instruct them. He, he tells them a parable. So if you have your Bibles, let's look at Luke chapter 14. Just if you have your Bibles or if you have it on your phone, you can click over to Luke chapter 14. I'll read you a few verses from Luke 14. So he told a parable to those who were invited. So you remember all these people here jostling for position. He's telling them this parable. Because he noted how they chose the best places. Jesus watches us the way we give. He watches the way we live. And he was watching what was going on. He's going to teach them. When you're invited by anyone to a wedding feast, do not sit down in the best place. Don't sit down in seat number two. <laughs> Least, lest one more honorable than you be invited by him. And he invited you and him come and say to you, give place to this man 
and then you begin with shame to take the lowest place. It makes you sad, like Jeremy said. But when you are invited, go and sit down in the lowest place so that when he who invites you comes, he may say to you, friend, go up higher. Then you will have glory in the presence of those who sit at the table with you. Whoever exalts himself will be humble. Then he who humbles himself will be exalted. Then he also said to him who invited him. Now, he's, first of all, he talks to the guests. He talks to all the guests. I don't know. It doesn't say if the host was number one or if another person was number one or Maybe they even put Jesus in number one. We don't know where he was situated. But he says to the host, wherever the host was seated, he says to the host. He said to the one who invited him. Now, this is the guy who invited him to his party, and this is what he says to him. When you give a dinner or a supper, do not ask your friends, your brothers, your relatives, your, nor your rich neighbors. Now, he's using an idiom here. So an idiom means it's a phrase. It uh, represents another truth, but not those exact words. In English, we might say that person's a bad egg, but they're not literally a bad egg. That means they're a bad person. So he's using an idiom. Of course, you can invite your friends. Of course, you can invite rich friends over. You, you can do that. He's using an idiom here. When you give a dinner or a supper, do not ask your friends, your brothers, your relatives, or your rich neighbors, lest they also invite you back and you be repaid. But when you give a feast, invite the poor, the maimed, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed. Our series is about a blessed life. In our life groups, we're talking about a blessed life. How do I live a blessed life? Well, generosity is the key. And you'll be blessed because they cannot repay you. For you'll be repaid at the resurrection of the just. And then from here, he gives a parable of the great supper where they went out and they invited a bunch of people to come to the supper and had excuses why they couldn't come. So let's talk a bit about how grace empowers generosity. We have our intern grads today, and uh, they're going to be launching out into careers and, and going into the next chapter of their life. And one of the keys to being successful in the next chapter of your life is to walk with generosity. Grace actually empowers our generosity. A generosity that comes from God is empowered by God's grace. So if you have your notes, if you happen to open up the app, the first point is this. Jesus first addressed the guests on their pride and their arrogance. Romans 12, 16 says, get along with each other, don't be stuck up, make friends with nobodies, don't be the great somebody. It's out of the Message Bible, get along with each other, make friends with nobodies. What they did when they would go to a meeting is they would joggle, jostle in place, because I want to sit beside the most important person. Now, that was the practice back then, but it's still practice today. What Jesus teaches here is so countercultural to what we have in our city today. Because typically when you go to a meeting, you look around and you're often thinking, where can I sit? Where can I position myself so I'll be seen by the right people or I could see the right people or I could up my business deal or get closer to something? Really, we're thinking a lot about ourselves when we do that. Jesus says here, now I want you to reconsider where you choose to sit when you go to a place. Don't look for the best place. Let yourself be brought up. It's so different than the way we'd normally do things. We're used to head tables, sit there, do this. He said, no, no, I don't want you to live that way. And he was speaking to people that were juggling around looking for the best seat in the house. So he first addressed the guests on pride and arrogance. One of the blockages to living a generous life is pride. One of the blockages to living a generous life is arrogance. If we get rid of pride, if we get rid of arrogance, we'll find that we live a much more generous life. So he addresses that with them. Secondly, now he, after addressing the guests, and I imagine they were squirming just a little bit, then he addresses the host, the person who invited him, the person who had fed him. He addresses him, and he addresses him on his selfishness. Because he said, what you've done is you've invited people to your home. But really, when you're inviting them, it's actually because you want to put them in debt to get a favor back from them. I'm going to do this for you, but really I'm expecting something in return. It was kind of an unwritten rule. I've done you a favor, but I expect something in return. 
And I know none of us has ever done that here today. We've never loaned anything or never done anything. But of course, even in our world today, that's there where we extend a favor and we kind of expect something to come back for it. Jesus told us to give and to loan, expecting nothing in return. That's so counter-cultural. It was so different to the world that they lived in. And he addressed a ruler on that. He addressed a big shot on that. You need to think about what you're doing. Philippians 2, verse 3, let's put this verse up tonight. It says, let nothing... Be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Nothing be done through selfish ambition. Where we sit, how we serve, rather with lowliness of mind, esteem others better than themselves. I prefer you. I prefer you to this seat. This is what he encouraged us to do. Selfishness gives, allows us to, what it does, it puts what they were doing here put that person in a position of indebtedness. I owe something back to you. He encourages them to invite people to your home. And we have life group, home groups, and we encourage people to come into our homes. Really, he's encouraging people to invite not just your friends. We should invite our friends. We should invite our neighbors. We should invite them to our home. But he also says another category. You should also invite the poor to your home. Invite those who don't have as much. Have them come to your house as well. Cities are, are crowded places. What is home for us? Home is more than just a place to sleep. Now, it is that. It's a place to sleep. It's a place to rest. But a home is, is more than that. It's a place where we get refreshed. It's a place where we get recharged. It's a, a place where we're energized. It's a place where we kind of escape from it all. And that may be your apartment but maybe somewhere else. They call Starbucks now the second home. Where, where do you go to get refreshed? Where do you go to get recharged? Jesus was saying, invite people into that space and, uh, and be with them there. Invite others, not just your friends, not just your relatives, not just somebody you want to get a connection with, but invite people that have nobody else to invite them. I think this might be a cure for loneliness in the city. It's counterculture. Jesus taught it way back when. This is extreme generosity. And it's only empowered by grace. The way we get to do this is because God's been so gracious to us. We got invited to a banqueting table that we never deserved to be invited to. And because we were invited, we turn around and invite other people that could never, ever repay us. In the Greco-Roman period, they worked the system. This is how you got ahead. And Jesus was going so against the grain. He said, no, I want you to do it different. I want you to invite others out. Thirdly, grace empowers us to be generous to more than just our friends and family. Matthew 5, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said this, 5 verses 43, and I'll skip to verse 48. You're familiar with the old written law, love your friend and its unwritten companion, hate your enemy. I'm challenging, you that, I'm challenging that. I'm telling you to love your enemies. Love your enemies. In a word, that's what I'm saying is grow up. Your kingdom subjects. Now live like it. Live out your God-created identity. Live generously and graciously toward others the way God lives towards you. Grow up. That's a challenging word from Jesus. I think he, he'd tell people today in Vancouver, grow up. Anybody can love those who love you. He said, it's one thing to love people that love you, but I'll ask you to love your enemies. Let's talk about Bill Gates for a bit. Bill Gates is the richest man in the world. He's got about between 84 and $87 billion. That makes him richer than a lot of countries in the world. Seriously, he's got more money than a lot of countries in the world. There are about 7.4 billion people in the world. If Bill Gates gave everybody $10 in the world today, he would still have left over $10 billion. If he gave every single person $10, he still has $10 billion left over. It's hard to imagine how much money he actually has. If he took his money and made 
and he made no more money, no more interest on it. He didn't make, earn another dollar. He's 60, let's say lives to be 90. Between now and the end of his life, he would have to spend $7.7 million a day. <laughs> Every day, yeah, and that's no more interest, he makes no more money. Every day he'd have to spend $7.7 .7 million. I mean, I'd like to try it for a week. I don't think I could. <laughs> Just, would you like to try it for a week? Just seven. I saw some people at Pitt Meadows say, yeah, I'd like to try that. 7.7 .7 a day. I mean, you could buy a plane. You could buy a building. You could buy a part of a house in Vancouver. <laughs> Actually, it might be easy to spend in Vancouver. By the end of the week, you could own a house. And then next week, it'd be worth twice as much. Uh, <laughs> that's a lot of money. Anyway, you slice it. He's got a lot of money. And he's given away a lot of money. The, the foundation that he has, he's given away something like $27, $28 billion. That's huge. And to good programs, he's had, he has done extreme generosity. There's no doubt about it. But in all his giving... His giving is pointed differently than God's giving. Because, you know, one thing he's never done, at least that I'm aware of. Now, you could correct me if I'm wrong. Just send me an email. Correct me if I'm wrong. But as far as I know, he's never made a massive donation to Apple. <laughs> he's never said, oh, Apple, I'm going to write you a check for $10 billion. He's not giving money to Apple. He didn't, write any, didn't get any money to Netscape. Some of you remember that. He, he's a business guy. He, he made his money by being very... Aggressive in the business world. He wasn't giving money to his enemies. But God so loved the world that he gave. When we were hostile to God, he was giving to us. This is where radical, grace-empowered generosity comes in. Jesus is actually asking us to be generous to our enemies. He's saying, let's go back to that verse in Matthew, because some of you were just looking at me at commercial then wondering, what did he just say? <laughs> You're familiar with the old written law. Love your friend, and as unwavering companion, hate your enemy. I'm challenging that. I'm telling you to love your enemies. I'm telling you to love your enemies. That would include being generous to your enemies. God was extremely generous. The Holy Spirit, Jesus, the Trinity was extremely generous to us in our brokenness. And when we hated God, he was loving us. The just, Jesus said, the rain falls on the just and the unjust. He's generous to everybody. In a word, that's what I'm saying. Grow up, you kingdom subjects. What would he say to Coastal Church? Grow up, love people. Love your friends, love your family, love your life group, love your church, love your city. But I'm also telling you, love your enemies. In the same chapter, Jesus said, pray for those who spitefully use you. It doesn't say, now sometimes we have people pray, oh, I'm going to pray against that person, man. He, whew, he <laughs> cut me off in traffic. That person, man, he fired me. I'm praying against that person. No, the Bible doesn't say pray against your enemy. It says, actually, pray for your enemy. So how do I pray for my enemy? Pray that their eyes would be open to the love of God. Pray the Holy Spirit would do his work. He comes to convict Men and women of sin, judgment, judgment, and righteousness. Pray that the Holy Spirit would do that work. Pray that God would send laborers into their path to tell them about his love. But we pray for, not against, our enemies. Pray for them. You know, one of the most generous things you can do is to pray. Actually, I think praying for others might be more generous than giving money. Because you can make more money, but you can't make more time. And I think it's easier, actually, to get a whole bunch of people to give money towards something to say, I want you all to come together to pray for something. It's easier for me to write a check and just say, here's a check for $1,000, but I, I've, got, I've, got, I've got something to do. But there's something when you say, I'm going to give an hour of my day to pray. I'm going to take Saturday morning between 8 and 9 or when on a different campus. I'm just going to come and pray. 
I'm going to give my time to prayer. Concert of prayer is this Thursday night. Commercial, Strathcona, Pitt Meadows, downtown. We have a concert. We can give this hour to God in prayer. I'm going to give this. Why is it so precious? Because I can never get that hour back again. I can't recover it. I think one of the most generous things we can do is come together and to pray. And God encouraged us to do that. 2 Corinthians 9, 8, it's our theme verse for this series. I love it on the Amplified Bible. It says this, God is able to make all grace. This, this is actually a very good verse to memorize. Be able to make all grace, every favor and earthly blessing come in abundance to you. Every favor and earthly blessing. That's a lot. So that you may always, under all circumstances, regardless of the need, have complete sufficiency in everything, being completely self-sufficient in him, and having abundance for every good work and act of charity. It all ties back into this thing called grace. He's able to, by his grace, he brings it to you so he can get it through you for every situation. The way that those people in that story would have been able to handle this is only by the grace of God. Only by the grace of God can you love your enemies. Only by the grace of God do I say, I don't need seat number two. I'm okay with seat number six. You know why I'm okay with seat number six? Because this verse says, all favor God will give to me. Seat number two, I'm like, man, I'll get here, I'll get favor, because I'll be close to number one. Oh, let's get a little selfie here. I was beside number one. I got some favor. I have some ideal cut. But if I trust this verse, it doesn't matter if I'm in seat number six or seat number 36, because God will make all grace. Grace is, I don't deserve it. I didn't earn it. He just grants me grace. So whatever the need, I'm self-sufficient. Folks, this is so freeing. Because I don't have to work the crowd. I don't have to joggle into position. Ooh, I got to get in the line up here. I got I to gotta get in the right spot because then I'll get my deal. They'll say they know me. They'll like me on Facebook. Now I'm going somewhere. I can actually just rest in God and His grace. That empowers me to be generous because it's not my effort. Now it's God working through me. Let me wrap this up. To experience God's grace, we have to come to his table first. Right after this story of these guys playing musical chairs, trying to sit beside number one, Jesus tells a story about his table. And in that day, you wanted to go to a supper to sit beside a very important person. The tragedy as he speaks to this audience is they don't know how important Jesus is, and so they don't come to his table. You, you don't realize it. I'm inviting you. So he invites one guy, and he's, he's too big to come. He's Mr. Realtor. He's Mr. Developer. He says, I just bought a piece of property, <clears throat> and I'm kind of a big deal in town, and I don't have time for your little, little banquet. Please excuse me. I'm a big deal. A big deal. Did you get that? I'm a big deal. I don't have time for your little party. But please excuse me. Next guy says, I like to come, but I'm too busy. I just bought myself a yoke of oxen, and I got to go test drive them. <laughs> There's no way. A person on that day would have bought that many oxen and not first tested them. It'd be like saying, you know, I just bought myself a uh, four, four, I don't know, four cars. I just bought myself four, which kind? Bentleys. Bentleys. Yeah, that'd be, <laughs> I just bought myself four <laughs> Bentleys. There's somebody with good taste. I just bought myself four <laughs> Bentleys. And I got to go test drive my Bentleys. No, you probably drove them or searched it before you bought them. Anyway, that was his excuse. You know, I'm too busy. You know, I bought some stuff. I got to go drive it. Have your little party. And then the third person says, 
One's too big. They all start with B. It'll help us remember. Too big. And that second one is I'm too busy. And the third one, I'm too blissful. Oh, I just married somebody. You know, I'm going to get married, whatever it was. And I, can't, I can't come. I just married a wife. No, bring your wife with you. That would be a nice thing to do. Take her to the party with you. Or too busy. Well, no, you could, you could test drive it later. The land will still be there. They're all excuses not to come to his table. So Jesus says, all right, go out in the highways, the byways, compel people, but my table must be full. And how do they come to the table? Not based on their merit, not based on what they've done. They only come because of the grace of God. And you know what? Today, God's grace is it's calling us to come to this banqueting table. And I hear the question that might be asked today, Boy, I think Jesus is doing a real hard thing. Because if I go out of my way and I invite somebody to my house and I act with this extreme generosity, chances are I'm going to get ripped off. They'll never repay me for what I did. So where is the economics in that? Jesus answered the question. He said, because the day coming in the resurrection, you will be repaid. You're looking for it to come at the wrong time. There is a day coming when you have done extreme acts of generosity to somebody who could never repay you. But I have not forgotten. I am going to repay you. So just hang on to that. But please, come to my banqueting table. I'm going to invite our campus pastors to come up. They're going to close with a couple of thoughts and then let you know how you too can come to this banqueting table. You don't want to miss Jesus' invitation to come. He said, come, the table is set. When we get to heaven, there's a great marriage supper of the Lamb, another great banquet waiting, and he has your name reserved. He wants you to be there at that table. So campus pastors, come on up. Tonight, I want to close in prayer here with us, and you have an invitation. Heaven sent you out an RSVP invitation. You need to respond. Maybe you're here and you've never responded to God's invitation to come to his banqueting table. The disciples had said, hey, when we get to heaven, their mother was there. One of us wants to sit on the right side. One wants seat number three and one wants seat number two. And uh, we want to just make sure we get those seats. And Jesus said, no, no, you don't get to decide that. Nowhere in the Bible do we know the seating order that we're going to have in heaven. I'm glad we don't know. And frankly, I really don't care where I sit. I'm just glad that, not based on what I've done, that I get to come to this table, that he's invited me. The only way I can be generous, really, in this world is because I've experienced so much generosity that I don't deserve from Jesus. So I'm going to end in a prayer tonight just before Karen comes up to share. Maybe you're here tonight and you've never yet opened your heart to receive him into your life. I'd invite you to do that tonight if you're here. It's amazing grace. It's extreme grace. But that's what empowers us to be generous. Because he loved us, because he welcomes us, we can love other people. We can even love our enemies, which is so not like our world. We're supposed to hate our enemies. He said, no, I'll, I'll give you enough love to love even your enemies. That's grace. That's a changed heart. So would you pray with me tonight a simple prayer? We'll all pray it out loud together. Dear Heavenly Father, this Saturday night, I receive by grace your love, your forgiveness. I accept what Jesus did. When he died and rose again, that I could have life. I receive it by faith. In Jesus' name, amen.